Good evening. Um, we are um, together in Linz today at the Kepler Salon to welcome Hanoch Benyami. Thanks very who much. came to Linz for the first time. I'm very, very happy um, that you came. Um, um, Hanoch is a professor of philosophy at the Central European University in Vienna. You received your PhD from Tel Aviv University and uh, your most recent work is on logic and language. Um, you work on various issues in the philosophy of mind, on questions of space and time, especially in relation to special relativity and quantum mechanics. But you also work on Wittgenstein and Descartes. Um, I have picked up that you know um, physics was your first love, and um, then you got into early modern philosophy. I don't know. Uh, I studied uh, physics and math uh, for my first degree, but uh, frankly, I don't remember what <laughs> I started to do in philosophy. It was so long ago. Now I do all these things you've mentioned. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought that maybe you know this interest in early modern philosophy is where the Descartes book came out of in 2015. Um, I would like, um, 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 so the book um, I'm talking about is Descartes' Philosophical Re Revolution, a reassessment, and I think the talk you're giving today um, has to do with the structure and the argument of the book. Um, I would like to um, start with a tradition that we have at this um, Stichproben. It's a particular lecture th series that we do here at Kepler Salon. Um, we means um, the Mittelbau of the Catholic private university. I'm usually um, um, with my co-host, Julia allersdorf Hertel, um, who is not here today, but hello. And um, the tradition we have is um, not that easy to explain, and it's actually more difficult to explain in English than it is in German. But um, since the name of the series is Stichproben, which means taking stabs you know, into the essence of people who work in philosophy, theology, and art, um, one of the first talks we had was about um, a practice um, that's called Bible stabbing. Now, Bible stabbing or Bibelstechen is a sort of um, you could say method or custom that people did around New Year's Eve where they take the Bible and insert the knife into the Bible to choose a random passage. And this random passage was then read and taken as a prediction or you know, it was interpreted to give meaning to the next year. Now I like to start um, the Stichproben with um, stabbing the very speaker's own books. So here we have, um, and let me give you the knife. I should do that, okay. And not from here, from here. okay, <laughs> fine. The book should survive, it's... it's Hopefully. Whoop. Okay, now I'm curious where we landed. Here we go. Oh, I don't have my glasses. It's, uh, let uh, me take my glasses. Yes, we need the glasses. I can hold the book for you if that hel helps. No problem. Okay. I don't need to read both pages. No, so no, no. Just, just, just here. That's where the knife was. Just one paragraph is fine. Mm -hmm. Despite his many experiments and observations, the Hart's original physiological hypotheses are extremely speculative. He makes claims about the microphysiology of the body that are devoid of any observational basis and which, as we shall see, are in general completely wrong, his usual confidence notwithstanding. The Hart thinks of the human body and of uh, the animal body generally as a hydraulic machine. The heart is a kind of boiler which heats the blood that enters it and causes it to... Uh, actually, it's interesting. Uh, perhaps I'll continue yes. reading. I, <laughs> I, I think I can stop here. Uh, and no, no, say no. a few no. things. Go uh, ahead, go ahead. Ah. Mm. Um, I was entranced. The heart is a kind of boiler which heats the blood that enters it and causes it to uh, rarefy and expand, and in this way makes it flow into the arteries. Unlike Harvey, the car did not think of the heart as a muscle pump, and he even argues at length against Harvey on this point. That's in the description of the human body. 
uh, 80, 11, 241 to 245. End of the paragraph. Okay. So now I should say something about it, right? Well, it's your choice to um, say something about it or segue right into your talk, whatever, you know, makes more sense. Yes. So uh, why did I bother in the book to say that uh, despite uh, Descartes' uh, aspirations and lots of work on physiology, usually that's not what we are familiar with uh, from Descartes these days because we read the meditations, parts of the discourse, but uh, he wrote a lot and worked a lot on physiology. He made also uh, vivisections of uh, animals. He attended uh, uh, anatomy classes in the Netherlands. And uh, he developed a really complicated ph physiological theory of the human body. And uh, almost everything was wrong. Now that's interesting because uh, he's an extremely important thinker despite of that. Despite of his uh, minimal contributions based on his uh, speculations and empirical work to physiology and to a few other things. And that's because his contributions, including there, are mainly as a philosopher. Namely, he makes various conceptual innovations. Um, I read uh, the part about the heart. The years Descartes was uh, working on his physiology, Harvey discovered the circulation of the blood. Harvey did it uh, by uh, vivisections on uh, dogs, calculating how much blood flows in the veins and so on. And this is uh, one of the major uh, discoveries in the history of physiology, which was a paradigm shift. And uh, Descartes dis uh, accepted Harvey and contributed to the spread of this idea in uh, France and on the continent. But unlike Harvey, who realized that the heart should be a kind of a spring which pushes the blood out, so Harvey was innovative in this aspect of uh, physiology as well, Descartes sticked to uh, the old uh, uh, Galenic idea, going back to Galen, Galenus, that the heart is a kind of boiler they saw some sort of fermentation, heat mm -hmm. generated there, and it's like uh, a boiler. That so Descartes was more conservative than Harvey, didn't make uh, an important contribution here, and still is very important in physiology. And he's important in physiology because of the conceptual changes, primarily because of the conceptual changes that he uh, brought about. And uh, these, some of these at least, will be also the topic of uh, my uh, talk today. So in this, uh, uh, instead, uh, really it was an uh, augury, what uh, choice, because mm -hmm. it fits uh, the uh, topic of uh, the presentation I'm going to uh, deliver uh, now. Uh, so I shall continue to... Thank you. Uh, yes, thanks very I would very much like you to start your talk. Excellent. Thanks very much. And uh, I think the title is already a bit. Um, <laughs> yes. The title is already a bit uh, provocative, I hope, because uh, metaphysics and, <coughs> and technology are not things that we usually bind together. <coughs> Sorry for that. It's all right. The figure here is an automaton from the 16th century probably by Gianello della Torre, whom we shall mention later again. And you can uh, find it in the Deutsches Museum in uh, Munich. There are a few such tomata. Um, I love them very much. I can, uh, if at some stage you, you have enough of philosophy, you can switch and I'll give you a talk about these automata. But uh, we start with the philosophy. And uh, we start with the traditional uh, picture we have of Descartes. That's a, a print, actually, I think, a painting by uh, Jean-Baptiste Moret um, called uh, Descartes Composant Son Système du Monde. Well, you can see it uh, at the bottom. And uh, it's uh, from an introduction to Descartes' philosophy from the late uh, 18th century, 1791. And we have here in the picture 
the traditional uh, image of the card. He uh, cleared practically everything from his table. You see the old world picture thrown uh, down on the floor, and he opens a new page. Well, there's uh, one or two books which he left there. We'll get to them later, I'll tell you which uh, books these are. But uh, that's a traditional picture of Descartes. Indeed, the picture of his uh, philosophy and of his methodology, which we find in the meditations, Meditations on First Philosophy, probably nowadays his best known book. And, uh, you know, he says he starts by throwing in doubt every previous uh, view and starting uh, by uh, finding uh, secure foundations and building everything uh, on them. So that's his own portrayal of the philosophical project. And I think that philosophy doesn't work this way and that his philosophy didn't work that way. And that the meditations, to a significant uh, degree, is a kind of uh, illusion. Not dishonestly so, but uh, still. And uh, to draw a different picture on how uh, Descartes uh, developed his philosophy, we have to start with the clocks. The clocks, the cogwheel clocks, were uh, an invention of, uh, with, of uh, one of the greatest inventions probably of medieval Europe. We have documentation of the first clocks from the late uh, 13th century. When uh, we read about clocks, in, uh, even in uh, Thomas, certainly in earlier uh, writers, they don't have uh, our uh, clocks with the cogwheels and weights and so on but they think about uh, sand and water and so on, and sun uh, dials. Um, the first clocks are from the late 14th, uh, 13th century. Here's uh, the mechanism of one of the, perhaps that's the earliest mechanism we have. It's from Salisbury, 1386. That's the original mechanism. The wood, I guess, and the rope are uh, much later, but that's uh, the original mechanism. And uh, these first clocks, Every clock has to have a source of energy. These first clocks worked on uh, gravity, on weights. Here are the weights. That's, these are the weights from Salisbury. So uh, such clocks are large, heavy, and primarily they are not mobile. If you uh, use weights as the source of energy, you shouldn't move your clock. And indeed, we did not have uh, mobile clocks until the 16th century, until a different source of energy for clocks was developed, the spring. Now, with the spring, you have a problem because uh, if you want to use a spring as the source of energy for your clock, you wind it up, and then when it unwinds, its force gradually decreases, so your clock will run more slowly. You don't want your clock to do that. So some uh, trick had to be invented, and this trick was the fusee. Here's the fusee. That's a modern uh, clock built according to those old uh, principles. That's the fusee, a spiral clock, a spiral wheel. Here, inside the barrel, you have the spring. You wind up the barrel, so when you finish winding it up, the spring has a largest force, but then the arm is smallest. And the force for turning around the Turk on the fusee is force time arm. And then as the spring here unwinds, the arm increases gradually. So the Turk remains uh, constant. Now, uh, this was a trial and error process because you couldn't manufacture springs with the same properties. So if you open an old clock from the 16th century, 17th century, and you see the fusee there, all the parts are from a metal, brass usually, but the fusee is from wood because they had to carve it out by trial and error until they managed to balance force and torque and the arm. 
So this was a complicated uh, process. The, this kind of clock working with a spring, a watch, was a very expensive thing. Add to it that uh, you put it in a gilded box with nice uh, artwork. It was a rare expensive thing and uh, people then liked to brag when they could afford a clock, a watch. This is Cosimo I of Medici in a portrait from 1560, bragging. Well, then these people uh, like to brag with their gadgets, right? Um, with his uh, dog and his uh, watch. It's called watch and not clock. You know, clock is a glock. It comes from the bell. You heard, uh, as we hear to this day, the church glocks, right? Glocken. Uh, but this, you don't uh, hear it, you watch it, right? So that's uh, the source of the name. Now, why did I go into all these uh, details? First, because I like it. So it's a weakness of character. But secondly, to uh, emphasize how rare these instruments were. Very few people owned a watch or saw a watch. And if this is true for clocks, it's even more so for clockwork automata. The watches were developed in Germany, actually, in the early 16th century. Very soon after the development, we find the first uh, automata, which were human form automata, Android automata. This beautiful little lady is from the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. You can go to the Kunsthammer and uh, see it. It was probably made by Jakob Bullmann of Nuremberg um, in the 1530s. That's the only automaton that we have from uh, Bullmann. We have more automata. I don't remember exactly how many, I think uh, six or seven, which we probably, which were probably made by Gianello Torriani or uh, Gianello della Torre or Juanello Turiano. He lived from around 1500 to 1585. That's an automaton which we can uh, ascribe to him with uh, quite uh, a lot of confidence. It's the one you saw on the cover of my book as well. Um, della Torre was, uh, was probably the most important uh, Renaissance artist, engineer, um, of whom you uh, didn't hear. De La Torre was uh, invited by Charles V, Carl V, to his court in uh, Spain. He made uh, clocks, automata, for Charles. When Charles passed away, he continued working for his son, Philip II. Uh, he made other things there. And uh, this automaton, is found today, <coughs> sorry, it's found today in the Smithsonian Museum in uh, Washington. And I'm uh, bringing a photo of him, of it here, also because it's uh, one of the few automata which uh, is still in working order. And here's what this uh, automaton can do. They have actually two automata. So uh, this is uh, I uh, impose the music on the video. <laughs> you see, it walks, turns around, it hits its chest with a mia culpa. If, in, you see, look at his eyes, even his. Uh, its eyes move in the sockets and it lifts the cross, well, I'll say to his lips, as if to kiss it. I think uh, watching it, now it's without the uh, robe and the cross, so you can see the mechanism better. I think it's impressive to see these automata working to, these, uh, to this day despite the compar comparative simplicity. This, you wind up the mechanism. And... 
soon you'll see the fusee, you see the fusee? The spiral wheel. Uh, yes, so the, the music is, the, uh, is a plain chant used by uh, José Luis de Victoria, so Spanish of about the same period. Regrettably, we must continue, and we continue to a description of uh, the automata of De La Torre, found about 50 years after his death, in uh, a work by Famiano Strada, who described the uh, wars in Belgium. He starts with uh, Charles V and General De La Torre, and here's what he writes on De La Torre, which is completely unreliable. It's false, and that's why I bring it. For often, so the translation is also from the 17th of the century. For often, when the cloth was taken away after dinner, he, De La Torre, brought upon the board little armed figures of horse and foot, some beating drums, others sounding trumpets, and diverse of them charging one another with their pikes. We don't have any real uh, evidence that De La Torre made any such automaton, but that's not the main thing here. Sometimes he sent wooden sparrows out of his chamber into the emperor's dining room that would fly round and back again. No chance he did anything of the sort. There's a kind of pile of confusions here. The superior of the monastery, who came in by accident, suspecting him for a conjurer. What do we see here? Well, I don't know whether the anecdote is uh, about the superior of the monastery is uh, reliable, but certainly this is how they struck people. People weren't familiar. That's why I gave this long introduction on how, this, how rare these things were. With the very idea, the word automaton did not exist then. It was coined in the middle of the 16th century, taken from a Greek, ancient uh, Greek, where it had a different meaning and started to be used for uh, these things. People were familiar with uh, the homunculus uh, that uh, Paracelsus, uh, by means of uh, alchemy, produced in his uh, chamber or with the uh, dwarfs and with fairies and, and so on. So that's how these things first looked uh, to them. They looked at these things and they struck them as uh, living. And you see, 50 years after De La Torre's death, and they already ascribe any possible motion to these uh, automata, flying around and uh, back and so on. So uh, um, we have people thinking about automata as capable of uh, doing any kind of motion, and they first strike them as living. Descartes turned it around. Descartes looked at living creatures, and to him they looked like uh, automata. So now we move to Descartes. Descartes was familiar with automata. In his uh, early notebooks, we even uh, find the uh, rudiments at least, of uh, design of uh, automata. He was a friend of uh, one engineer, Villebercieux, and uh, it is said um, in his uh, early biographies that he designed some automata with uh, Villebercieux. We don't know how uh, accurate this was, but certainly he was familiar with automata and uh, with the, the technology of their age. And Descartes is the first author in history first author in history, to compare living creatures to automata. We have features of living creatures compared to those of uh, machines, automata, already earlier, already in Aristotle, but not life itself. That's an innovation of Descartes. Descartes moved to uh, the Netherlands in uh, 1628, among other things, started to write a physiology 
of uh, the human body, which uh, with the other writings of the period he suppressed when he heard about the trial of Galileo. He described the uh, main ideas of uh, his physiology in the Discourse of, on Method, which he published later in 1637. And uh, there he describes the human body as a kind of machine. And here's how he justifies the idea that the body of a living creature is a machine. This, this conception of the human body, will not seem at all strange to those who know how many kinds of automata or moving machines. Let me just show you here. He writes automata in italics or moving machines. That's because the work is in French and he cannot trust his readers to know what automata means. So he adds moving machines because they wouldn't know what that means. Um, the skill of man can construct with the use of very few parts. In comparison with the great multitude of bones, muscles, nerves, arteries, veins, and all the other parts that are in the body of any animal. When we realize that, uh, those familiar with automata will regard this body as a machine, which, having been made by the hands of God, is incomparably better order than any machine that can be devised by men and contains in itself movements more wonderful than those in any such machine. So the possibility of automata is used by Descartes to uh, justify the conception of the living body as a machine. Now this is uh, momentous, I would say, because if it's a machine, there are things that it doesn't need. One, the most important of them is a soul. And this is something very important uh, to Descartes. Now I'll show you a passage from uh, the book he suppressed on men, which was published in the 1630s. But the same uh, claims are found also uh, in works that he published uh, later during his life, later than the discourse. I should like you, the reader, to consider that these functions, all the functions he developed, he described in this artificial man, in the, the machine man, all these uh, functions follow from the mere arrangement of the machine's organs, every bit as naturally as the movements of a clock or other automaton. You see again the automaton uh, comparison to justify the conception, follow from the arrangement of its counterweights and wheels. In order to explain these functions of the human body, then it is not necessary to conceive of this machine as having any vegetative or sensitive soul or other principle of movement and life apart from its blood and its spirits. Vegetative, sensitive soul, those of you familiar with Aristotle will know that, uh, will recall that Aristotle has vegetative, sensitive and rational souls. And here we find two of them eliminated. You don't need them. They are reduced, if you wish, to mechanical principles. All we need is the blood and spirit. Spirits here is not a kind of uh, a soul, ghost, whatever, but a very refined uh, liquid or fire. That's uh, what it means in the cart, which are agitated by the heat of the fire burning continuously in its heart, in the machine's uh, heart. And now, just so that you don't think that this fire is a special fire, he adds, a fire which has the same nature as all the fires that occur in animate bodies. We don't need any special principle not found in, in animate nature. Life doesn't require any principle beyond, uh, in anim beyond those found in inanimate uh, nature. Now, uh, this is a big uh, change. You don't need a soul for life. The soul, until Descartes, was conceived as the principle of life. Here's Plato, writing in the 4th century BC. Tell me then, this is Socrates talking, what is that of which the inherents will render the body alive? The soul, he replied, we need a soul in order to have life. And is this always the case? Yes, of course. Then whatever the soul possesses, to that she comes bearing life. The soul brings life. This is exactly what we saw the card denying. 
it's not only Plato who wasn't a materialist or monist, it's also Aristotle in his De Anima, so a very different approach to uh, metaphysics, life, and soul. What has soul in it differs from what has not, in that the former displays life. The soul is the principle of life. That's Plato, that's Aristotle, that's not Descartes. And Descartes is explicit about it. Here is Descartes in, uh, 1914, in, 96, in 1649, sorry, the last uh, book he published in his life, The Passions of the, on the, of the Soul, rejecting that kind of thought. It has been believed without justification that our natural heat and all the movements of our bodies depend on the soul, whereas we ought to hold on the contrary, that the soul takes its leave when the, we die only because this heat ceases and the organs which bring about bodily movement decay. So to avoid this error, let us know that death never occurs through the absence of the soul, but only because one of the principal parts of the body decays. So it's not that the, we die because the soul leaves the body. Because we die, the soul leaves the body, right? That's the effect, the soul leaving the body and not the cause. The cause. And in order to convince us in that, here's again the automaton analogy. The difference between the body of a living man and that of a dead man is just like the difference between, on the one hand, a watch or other automaton, again, this is in French, that is a self-moving machine, when it is wound up and contains its, in itself the corporeal principle of the movements for which it is designed, uh, and on the other hand, the same watch or machine when it is broken and the principle of its movement ceases to be active. A dead man is a broken clock, nothing to do with the soul. So this is a momentous change, as I, I take it. Here's the soul, as uh, we used to think about it from Aristotle on. It has uh, three parts, vegetative, sensitive, and rational, or the mind, nous, uh, mens, anima, and one of its parts is the mens. That's from Aristotle on. But that's what we have from the carton. Just the mind. Aristotle wrote the anima. You read 16th century philosophy writings that are on the soul. From the cards on, we have a treatise on human understanding, principles of human knowledge. The soul disappears. We have only mind. Um, this struck some of his contemporaries is a, a radical departure from uh, standard thought. Perhaps uh, you know that when the Meditations uh, was published, Gersen, Descartes' uh, friend who uh, took care of the publication, sent uh, the manuscript to several uh, philosophers in order to have them uh, comment on the book and the cart uh, respond and uh, this is very helpful uh, for the understanding uh, of the cart and actually I think in some ways uh, uh, it's development because it influenced him to think further about uh, some points. One of these uh, philosophers was Gassendi, one of the important uh, French philosophers of the age, a bit older than the cart and Gassendi wrote sarcastically and uh, Descartes responded uh, with the same tone. Um, and here's Gassendi about uh, soul and mind in Descartes. Gassendi's objection, I thought I was addressing a human soul, <laughs> or the internal principle by which a man lives, has sensations, moves around, and understands. Instead, I find I was addressing a mind alone, which has divested itself not just of the body, but also of the very soul. That's a picture we saw earlier, right? Um, Descartes, in this case, responds uh, in a composed uh, manner. Here's his explanation. Primitive man probably did not distinguish between, on the hand, one hand, the principle by which we are nourished and grow, 
and accomplished without uh, any thought or other operations, which we have in common with the brutes, animals, and on the other hand, the principle in virtue by which, of which we think. He was very primitive, <laughs> one could say. Anyway, he therefore used the single term anima, soul, to apply to both. And when he sub subsequently noticed that thought was distinct from nutrition, he called the element which thinks mind and believed it to be the principal part of the soul. So this is how he got uh, to Aristotle's conception of first soul and then one part, which is the mind. But Descartes is more enlightened, realizing that the principle by which we are nourished is wholly different in kind from that by virtue of which we think have said that the term soul is ambiguous. If we are to take soul in special sense, and what is special of the human being, the term must be understood to apply only to the principle and virtue by which we think. So to avoid any ambiguity, he uses in the meditations only mens for this. That's true of the meditations, not on the, uh, which is in Latin, not of the French writings, uh, where he uses um as well as uh, other terms. So mind is not part of the soul, but that's the thinking soul in its entirety. Um, so uh, notice what we have done so far. We have considered the automata developed in the generation before Descartes, and uh, we have shown how considering them has brought Descartes to uh, eliminate the need for a special principle in uh, order to explain a life. We have uh, reduced the principle which we don't find in inanimate nature to the mind alone. And this is not uh, by the train of thought that we find in uh, the meditations, but just by um, considering technology and its uh, possibilities. Now you can ask me, okay, Hanoch, but why did he leave the mind as an immaterial entity? Why didn't he go all the way and say that also the mind is uh, mechanical? The answer here is again due to the uh, mechanisms of the age, this time not to the breakthrough made with them, but to their limitations. And we find this argued for in uh, Descartes' uh, discourse, in the uh, fifth discourse of the discourse on uh, method. And Descartes says he has two uh, conclusive reasons for that. If any such machine, so suppose, you know, uh, you decide, okay, let's build an automaton which uh, imitates uh, as uh, perfect as possible a human being. There are two certain ways to, dis uh, to establish that it's an automaton and not a real human being. Such machines, um, uh, we should still have two very certain means of recognizing that they were not real men, such machines. What are they? One of them is dedicated mechanisms versus universality. Dedicated mechanisms, that's a contemporary term, and not Descartes, but the idea is found in Descartes. The idea is simple. You want your automaton to do something, let's say hit its breast with its uh, right arm, you have to put something for uh, that to happen. You want it to turn after 40 centimeters right, you have to put in something that uh, makes that. You want it to turn it. You have to have a dedicated mechanism for every kind of motion. Not so with us. We have the mind, and the mind is a universal instrument. Even though such machines might do some things as well as we do them, or perhaps even better, they would inevitably fail in others, which would reveal that they were acting not through understanding, but only from the dispositions of their organs. Why so? Whereas reason is a universal instrument, 
It's in French, it's Tromet Universel, which can be used in all kinds of situations. These organs need some particular disposition, that's a dedicated mechanism, for each particular action. Hence, it is for all practical purposes impossible for a machine to have enough different organs to make it act in all contingencies, whatever happens, right, uh, of life in the way in which our reason makes us act. So that's one sure method to know that it's not a that's something that we can do because of our mind, i.e., that's one reason to think mind cannot be reduced to mechanisms. What's the other reason? The Turing test not called by this uh, term by Descartes, of course, but it's there. Machines could never use words or put together other signs as we do in order, what, to declare our thoughts to others. It's not that we can't build machines that talk, declare our thoughts to others. For we can certainly conceive of a machine so constructed that it utters words, and even others words which correspond to bodily actions causing a change in its organs, I skip that parenthesis, but it is not conceivable that such a machine should produce different arrangements of words, now this is very important, as to give an appropriately meaningful answer to whatever is said in its presence, as the dullest of men can do. So if I ask you a question, you can respond to the question according to the meaning of what you were asked. No machine can do that. You can build a machine like a Barbie doll, you know, you put it on its back, it says good night, things like that. But you ask it something and it responds according to the meaning of what uh, you have asked it, that's, he says, inconceivable, without any explanation. Why is it inconceivable? Because the machines he could conceive are elaborations of the machines of his age and he could conceive of any form of motion, like the flying birds that we saw ascribed to, but he couldn't conceive of anything of this sort. That's why he states it as something obvious, without an argument. And he adds, as the dullest of men can do. Now, that's not a rhetorical uh, flourish. Nothing like that in Descartes. He means it seriously, because the dullest of men has a soul, has a mind. So the dullest of men can respond meaningfully to questions. He mentions the, the deaf and uh, um, uh, people who, uh, you know, if you sit with them, you see that they have a language of their own. And uh, so even they have a language. You don't find a person who cannot respond according to the meaning of what... Uh, so that's a kind of divide between the human kingdom on one side and the animal machine kingdom on the other side. This uh, Turing test. So uh, um, that's why the mind is immaterial. You can't reduce it to mechanical principles. And that's why we have dualism. We don't have dualism before Descartes. Before Descartes, we have had some monist views. Ep uh, Epicurus, and the atomists were monists. And we, were, we had systems which were not monist systems. For instance, Plato or the Neoplatonists. Neoplatonism was very strong in Renaissance philosophy also. But these are not dualists. They have degrees of being. That's the uh, non-monist ontology before Descartes. So the top is God or the one, if you open the Republic, Politeia, by Plato, that's what we have uh, over and above being, Plato says, Socrates says. Then we have the mind, a bit uh, lower degree of reality, soul, meaning by that the principle of life. We go down, we have the body, lower degree of being, and then we have reflections, dreams, and if you go a bit further down, you have as you can see clearly, six uh, non-being. That's a non-monist, but from the cult on, we don't have degrees of being. We have dualism. The mind for the cult is as real as the body. The body is as real as the... And uh, you have uh, two things. So you see, 
it's not only that we eliminated the soul as the principle of uh, life, but on the basis of the technology of the age, we arrived at dualism. First time in history, dualism. So we already have a significant move from technology to uh, metaphysics. But perhaps some uh, here don't like it uh, that much and say, okay, 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 Hanoch, we are completely convinced in what you have said. But you didn't show us that the argument of the meditations doesn't work. So although in this respect, we have in Descartes, in his uh, discourse and in his uh, Passions of the Soul and uh, Man and so on, we have uh, this move from technology to metaphysics which you described. We still have the cogito with everything that follows from it. I don't think that's the case. I think that, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, the meditations is to a significant degree an illusion. The method which is claimed to be used there, starting from doubts, etc., is not the method actually followed. I think that Descartes' complete worldview is there from the very beginning. Of course, I don't have time to go through all the meditations, so I'll uh, follow Descartes in one thing. I'll take the cornerstone of the foundations of all the construction, the cogito, and uh, I'll try to show you that the cogito is not what uh, it is claimed to be. In order to do that, I start with the... I'm sure that you are all familiar with the, the cogito as you, we find it in the meditations, and everybody knows uh, Je pense donc je suis, or cogito ergo sum, the first of the discourse, the letter from uh, the Principles of Philosophy, I'll show a version which is less familiar. So, to start off with what is clearest, I ask first whether you yourself exist. Are you perhaps afraid that you might be deceived in this line of questioning? Surely, if you did not exist, you could not be deceived at all. Right? So this is just what we find in the, the discourse and the meditations. And now the usual contribution of uh, B, Go on. What does A say next? Therefore, since it is clear that you exist, and it would not be clear to you unless you were alive, this too is clear. You are alive. Do you understand that these two points are absolutely true? Now we have understanding, right? Yes, indeed. Then this third point is also clear. Namely, you understand, i.e. you have a mind. Clearly. Right. Now, I guess, uh, I don't know whether people know from where this is uh, taken. Usually people don't know. Um, so uh, I won't uh, ask you, but uh, tell you. That's from Augustine, on the free choice of the will, namely 400 AD, 1200 years uh, and more before Descartes. Um, we find the cogito in several versions already in Augustine. Everybody in France in Descartes' age knew these things. I mean, I should say, everybody who was anybody. The, the Augustine was a very central figure in the Counter-Reformation, especially for the Oratorians, and they were familiar with it. Descartes sends the text of the discourse to Mersenne to get printed. The first thing he publishes the first version of the Cogito. Mersenne writes back, oh, that's like in Augustine, City of God. A few years before the discourse is uh, published, Silon, another guy from Descartes, uh, from Mersenne Circle, published a work with the Cogito in it. There, uh, ascribed to Augustine. 1638, so a year later, uh, Campanella, Perhaps people here know him from his political thought. City of Sun, of the Sun publishes a kind of big tome. I, I saw it in the one Oxford library. You know, you have to take it out from the shelves with both hands, so on. And there you also find uh, the Cogito quoted from Augustine. So people were familiar with uh, Augustine then. The version quoted by uh, Campanella, if I remember correctly, is the one that uh, Descartes actually, I think, uh, is closest to. That's the book that he left on his uh, desk, which I mentioned earlier. It's from uh, 
the Trinitate on the Trinity, and I'll show you uh, some passages from it. If then we pass over those things that come from the senses of the body into the mind, so you see we, we have already had doubt about the senses, as in Descartes, how much remains of things we know just as we know that we live? Here at least we have no fear of being accidentally deceived by some apparent likeness to the truth, because it is certain that even he who is deceived lives. You see uh, again the proximity. What next? The dream argument. Not even the skeptic can say perhaps you are sleeping and you do not know and you see in dreams. But he who is certain about the knowledge of his own life does not say in it, I know that I'm awake, but I know that I live. Even if he dream. And here's the, uh, even he who is deceived lives, qui fali tu vivit. So you see even the choice of words and phrasing is so close to Augustine. Now, uh, that's uh, from uh, on the Trinity. Now, I'm not showing you this in order to say Descartes plagiarized. He did. He didn't like to give credits. He takes uh, himself credit for things he did not uh, uh, develop, but he developed uh, a lot which is uh, really original and highly influential. So I'm not, uh, I don't intend to deny any of that. I'm showing you this not because of uh, the indebtedness to Augustine, but because of the things you find in Augustine and you don't find in Descartes. We find several versions of the cogito in Augustine and several versions in Descartes. What we find in most of the versions in Augustine, but in none of the versions in Descartes, is this thing, life, life, life. Augustine infers three things which survive the skepticism about the, the, the senses, the dream argument, the possibility of being wrong in mathematical calculations. Three things. You exist, you live, you understand. Descartes has only two things. You exist and you understand. Life disappeared. Now why? If you are thinking, aren't you alive? Why did life disappear? It disappeared because of Descartes' new metaphysics. Life is not a property of the soul. Augustine, the Neoplatonist, thinks that the soul brings life. So, of course, life is a property of the soul, and if the soul is there, we are alive. Augustine likes to uh, quote the Bible saying, because thou art a living God. So that's a property not of the material thing, of the soul. Not so for Descartes, for the technological reasons. So Descartes takes Augustine's cogito and eliminates the part which does not fit his uh, complete metaphysics. So even the cogito is in this way indebted to uh, what Descartes inferred from, his, uh, from the technology of his age and its uh, limitations. Now, uh, right, so this is what I wanted to say about Descartes. But um, I think it would be interesting here to show that it's not a one-off thing. This is how uh, such big changes in philosophy, I think, work not in the, for, because of the kind of uh, uh, thoughts or method you find in the uh, meditations. In order to do that, I'll uh, jump uh, 300 years uh, forward to this uh, guy's contribution, Turing, Alan Turing. He's uh, one of the great heroes of the 20th century. Um, one of the two main uh, developers of the computer, together with uh, von Neumann. He made uh, incredible uh, contributions you know, to the deciphering of the enigma of the code. And uh, in this way, he saved uh, millions of, li million of lives, millions of lives, and uh, shortened the course of the Second World War. And he also made uh, seminal contributions to logic and mathematics. And then, uh, because he was gay, 
they, uh, he had to undergo a chemical castration and he committed to suicide. So a real tragic uh, hero. And uh, Turing wasn't just a great mathematician, and this was a computer scientist, he also uh, studied philosophy properly with uh, an excellent uh, teacher who actually studied here in uh, Linz uh, when he went to gymnasium, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, Turing became very close uh, to Wittgenstein when he joined Cambridge in the mid-1930s. And so Turing has a position in a sense similar to Descartes. On the cutting edge, both of the technology of his age, groundbreaking technology with which very few are familiar, and, uh, and with the philosophy of his age. And uh, you know, uh, during the first uh, important paper is uh, on the computing machinery, where you find uh, the Turing uh, machine. You know, uh, a, a stripe going through the machine that has a head, the changes and so on, and Turing machine is a universal Turing machine. It develops in that paper the idea of a universal machine. Its only limitations are due to its memory. So the idea that we find in Descartes, that unlike machines that need dedicated mechanisms, our mind is a universal instrument, you remember the quotation? This cannot be held after the uh, computer uh, has been developed, because the computer and Turing proves it is, is also a universal machine. So this argument, which you do find until the 1940s, disappears with the development of uh, the computer. One of uh, Descartes' two arguments is gone. What about the other uh, argument, the uh, Turing test argument? Well, Turing, Turing's test is not Turing's test. It is Descartes' text, test. And here's the proof. That's the proof, you see? Why is this the proof? Because of this. This is um, a paper which was presented by uh, uh, Geoffrey Jefferson in Manchester. In 1949, he was an important uh, neuroscientist of the age. And with the rising uh, cybernetics, he uh, gives a talk in which he describes the, in principle, differences between man and the machine. And you can see here that uh, Jefferson mentions Descartes made a point, a basic one, that a parrot repeated only what it has been taught, etc. And you have him quoting from Descartes here. Um, from which it uh, comes that it is morally impossible that there be enough the occurrences, etc. Right? This is the passages we read earlier. Now, this page which I show here is uh, from Turing's library, King's College, uh, Cambridge. I asked the librarian to send me this uh, photocopy of the paper. Turing reads the paper in 1949, and he makes two thick lines in the margins. One about an argument, I don't remember the details now, I should have checked it, um, which he uh, goes on to discuss in his... Uh, 1950 mind paper and uh, ascribes it to Jefferson and this is the other one, the Kant's argument. So Turing reads this, sits down and writes, ah, that's the uh, quotation from Jefferson, sorry I forgot that it's here, right? The two certain means of recognizing the deceit which we've mentioned and uh, Turing writes his paper 
and uh, says there that uh, uh, describes the imitation game and uh, says there that he believes that you know in about 50 years uh, computers will pass the uh, imitation game I believe that at the end of the century the use of words in general educated opinion will have altered so much that uh, one will be able to speak of machines thinking without expecting to be contradicted he's right right 2000 we can say machines think and we are not expecting to be contradicted but notice I believe the cart had inconceivable without argument Turing said I believe he doesn't he cannot describe how computers will be developed so that they will pass the imitation game but the existence of the new technology makes him confident that this will be possible again the technological uh, possibilities change what we think uh, is possible and with it our metaphysics now Turing didn't think that uh, didn't argue that we are uh, machines that we are computers but before the end of the decade in comes Putnam during his 1950 and argues that our mind is a probabilistic Turing machine and with this change of paradigm we have the rise of materialism in the second uh, half of the 20th century the cards two certain arguments have been uh, eliminated by Turing with the help of his uh, new technological horizons and uh, with this uh, I uh, end thanks very much thank you very much wow I was wondering um, where this was going when we were still with Descartes and Descartes announcing that it was impossible um, given the chat GPT. Yes. <laughs> so that was unavoidable, you know, to just think, you know, further while you were still talking about Descartes and, you know, contradicting Descartes in our minds because we are already with Turing. However, mm, if I may, I mean, the last thing you said, um, and I'm sure the audience, um, like me, is still processing that, um, was saying that um, a new materialism is arising or has been arising on the horizon for the last 50 years because of the development in technology. And I do not disagree with that. I just, um, I just would like to ask you, So, because we cannot differentiate between the soul and the body, because that you know distinction doesn't make sense after the changes that the technology has brought us. But it's a changed materialism, nevertheless. You know, it's not the same materialism that we started with, you know, so long ago at the very beginning, um, or even before the beginning of philosophy, before the beginning of Socrates, before. So, how... I, I know it's an impossible question, but I can't um, help myself asking it since I have you here, and I'm sure you thought about it a lot. So how does that new materialism that we are in the midst in actually work? Um, how does it work? Why are we convinced or what's the viewpoint that it suggests? What, the psychological problem or... Uh, <laughs> I, am I mean, you still have mind. Mm -hmm. You know, we yeah. never got rid of mind. Sure. You know, we got we got rid of um, the soul. So, what kind of mind, what kind of materialistic mm -hmm. mind, can we imagine ourselves to be after this? Yes, um, it's uh, so. Of course, you cannot eliminate either a life or a mind. Right. And Descartes did not eliminate life. 
he just uh, said, just, no, it's just, but he's, he argued that uh, it does not uh, require any principle that we don't find in inanimate nature as so, well. You take uh, together uh, all these inanimate things, arrange them in the right way, and uh, mm -hmm. lo and behold, a living uh, organism, you don't need to uh, ask God to uh, insert a soul into it. Right. But you have uh, uh, a living uh, creature. Now, similarly, the post-Turing uh, thought is, uh, idea is, of course we think, but you don't need a special principle uh, for it. You take uh, you know, an organism, you rearrange its uh, brain a little, and you, you, start, you don't need uh, any different principle. So w we certainly think. But uh, we don't need uh, anything over and above, uh, or any principle over and above what is anyway found in uh, inanimate nature um, for that, or animate nature for that. So uh, that's, that's the approach. Of course, you've had uh, all sorts of uh, philosophers uh, overexcited with eliminativism or things like that, but uh, this is... Uh, uh, kind of a disgrace we should uh, keep at home and not show the public. Um, so uh, the influential ideas are, are not like uh, that. And of course you can't deny the existence of uh, thinking creatures like uh, us. Um, I, I'll, I'll give you an example how it uh, influenced uh, metaphysical thought in philosophy. You find today quite a few philosophers arguing from the closure of physics to materialism, to the supervenience or whatever of mind by uh, the body. Now, until uh, we had these developments, uh, and, uh, computer, etc., nobody thought, uh, or at least rare cases, but the general thought was that physics is not closed because uh, you have the mind interfering in physics. Okay, you, uh, physics uh, does the work well enough until the mind, uh, until you come to creatures with an intellect, with a reason, and there you need something else. This is explicit in Descartes. So uh, the, the conviction in the closure of physics is uh, a result of uh, the rejection of uh, Descartes' uh, arguments and not uh, uh, what motivates rejecting them. Um, so that's uh, how I see the dynamics within uh, philosophy. Um, yes. So I, I hope this at least addresses in an interesting uh, way the point, uh, point you have raised. I can say also some things about chat GPT which interests everybody today. Mm. Well, I will come, come back to that. Um, from a different side, but um, I'd like to open up um, for questions from the audience, if I may. And um, is there one in from at home? Why don't we start with um, that? If that's okay with you, Kerstin. Okay. I said uh, at home; it might be the office or anywhere. But yeah, we got an email from Baumgartner, um, he or she wrote us, uh, thank you for the interesting lecture. In my modern understanding, the mind is not separated from the body because it's an interconnected system. Scientists speak of the stomach as an entity like the mind because of the similarities to how the brain works. Do you agree on that? Well, first, when it comes to philosophy, scientists are not an authority, often they are the disease. So uh, I don't think they have, uh, you know, we can simply accept what they say. I've uh, seen uh, scientists, uh, excellent scientists also, turn to philosophy and uh, with a arrogant overconfidence uh, expose their ignorance. So that's generally about scientists doing uh, philosophy. But uh, I wouldn't even, so now it's not really a question about uh, the Kant's position or uh, Turing's. Um, but uh, still I'll answer it. 
I wouldn't talk about the mind as an entity like the stomach or any other organ of the body or the brain. I wouldn't even talk about uh, the mind if I could. I would talk about uh, mental, rational capacities that we have. We think, we reason, we draw conclusions, we make decisions, we uh, hesitate, uh, we argue, and so on. So these are capacities that we have. I would say a human being, the way that uh, they have the capacity to uh, what, digest food, they have the capacity to think, reason, and so on. So uh, mind, since it's uh, a noun, might mislead us here. It's better to talk about uh, mental uh, capacities, rational capacities. And this is something that a human being has. You, Mr. or Miss Baumgartner, can think, can argue, can form an opinion, can cast out on things. You, not your stomach, obviously, not your brain, not any part of you. You, the human being. Um, yes. So uh, the talk about the mind is an indirect way of talking about uh, uh, rational and related capacities of human beings. I hope this uh, addresses at least <laughs> the question. Thank you. I say in lieu of um, the email response, um, Kerstin. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, it works. The mic works. Uh, yeah, also, I also want to thank you for the very interesting, uh, interesting in a good kind of way, uh, presentation. And I would like to ask one question uh, about the uh, relation or interconnection between life and mind. Because for me it's pretty interesting because it's kind of contradictory to many ideas of modern understanding of life, which is rather considered in terms of a materialist, not in terms of a neo-materialist, rather a classical uh, way of thinking in terms of life, body, physiological processes, especially in terms of self-sustainment and reproduction, procreation, and so on. And I think it's very interesting, this idea of connecting life to mind, and maybe you can tell a little bit more, little bit more about it, and maybe do you know when was the switch from the connection from life and mind to life and body and life and physiological and somatic processes? Thanks. Um, I'll try to answer and uh, if you see that it's not exactly what you had in mind, interrupt me and uh, we'll, uh, I'll adjust so that uh, I answer more uh, precisely too. So um, let's go back to Aristotle. As uh, you know, I've shown you this. Uh, oh, we don't see it on the. Well, good, excellent. Thanks very much. Um, on the left, we have Aristotle. The mind is one part of the soul. Right? So, uh, uh, mental life is part of life. Mental life. Okay. Not everything uh, which is alive has mental lives. So for Aristotle, no animal and no plant have a mental aspect, um, although they are alive. The plants have only vegetative soul, the animal is vegetative and sensitive soul as well, but none has a, a, a noose, a rational soul. So uh, for Aristotle, to have, a men to have mentality was, with the few uh, reservations, to be alive in a certain way. It reflects a certain kind of life. Now, Aristotle, and that's a kind of problematic part in his uh, thought in the anima and elsewhere, also was committed to some sort of uh, survival after death. This is Platonic and other influences. So uh, it's unclear how this fits together and it, it has been a source of debate already in antiquity in uh, Aristotle interpretation. But uh, be that as it may, we certainly have primarily in Aristotle the conception of uh, uh, the mind or uh, reason, uh, intellect 
as an aspect of life. It's only some animals, actually human beings, have. Now, uh, with the Descartes, we have this separation. The part which is responsible for thought is unrelated to life. You can have life without uh, mentality and you can have the, this mind, the thinking being, surviving and thinking, right? Which uh, fits uh, religious thought over the mon this monotheistic religious thought over generations. Also, again, with some reservations, it's always you get into the details, the fabric is never completely simple and homogenous. Uh, so even the, but I won't go into these uh, reservations now. So I would say a kind of independence of uh, between mental existence and life was strongly supported um, by uh, Descartes' thought. And uh, this is something which uh, um, in recent decades, because of the you know, process I described, going back to Turing, etc., um, does not hold uh, such a sway over our thought as it used to following Descartes. Does this uh, yes. it help? Yes, it helps a lot. Thank you. And I have a rather question. This is a question, if I remember correct, from my philosophy studies. I guess, but um, also in Descartes' thinking, there was a kind of connection between body and mind. and. Somebody told me he considered the pineal gland being that connection. Is this true or is this just a myth? Yes, but this is causal connection. So uh, uh, according to Descartes, there are these two uh, substances, two entities, <coughs> the body of a human being and the mind of a human being, and they interact, right? We do things because of what we think. <coughs> so. Uh, uh, I perhaps uh, I can give uh, Luisa water because she's coughing. So I thought, oh, she might need this. You see, this is a demonstration of the mind-body relation. I thought something and did something. So uh, how does how can this happen? So they must interact somehow. And Descartes had uh, his hypothesis about uh, the locus of this interaction, which is just in the pineal gland. That's because he found a kind of a body which doesn't split into two in the brain, right? So it's uh, in the center of the brain and he had this theory about that's the place where they interact. But it's like uh, two different entities that interact. I interact with the chair, I can move the chair and so on and the chair holds me. But we are two different entities. Similarly for the mind and the body, although unlike me and unlike, certainly unlike the chair, the mind is immaterial. So the we have interaction. How does this happen? Descartes uh, says, I don't know. We know it happens, we don't know how. But I think this is pretty interesting because maybe I'm wrong because, but uh, please correct me if I tell something wrong, but I hear from antique philosophy, yeah, they consider the soul not so much in the brain, rather than the heart or anything like this. But I mean, the pineal gland, it is a part of the brain. And he considered this part of interaction between body and soul inside the brain. And I think this is pretty interesting. Uh, interesting also, um, he said, I do not know why, but how did he come to this idea of all the pineal gland? Yeah, because this is really interesting, yeah? Yes. Because it is a pretty par important part of the uh, neuronal system uh, or the neuronal interactive system, but I think, how did he come to this idea? Because, um, yeah, maybe I'm wrong and there might be others before, but from the things I've been told, uh, I learned that former uh, philosophers rather consider the heart or anything else as the part where body and soul, news and, uh, um, how can you say, the um, yeah, the other, the vegetable and uh, emotional soul uh, collide, are yes. situated in the heart and not so much in the head. So, um, yes, so um, indeed, um, if you go back to earlier times in antiquity, namely early antiquity, you indeed find uh, uh, many philosophers arguing that uh, the soul or the mind or 
interact pr primarily with the heart. This is Aristotle. Not all of them. Uh, Plato thought that it's the brain. And uh, what is the Malkimna? So also thought because he saw that the optic nerve goes to the brain, that it's the brain. But um, in uh, the following century, the brain started to uh, have the more central dominant role. And this is due to f experiments that they ran. So uh, actually some horrible experiments also, because uh, the uh, doctors in uh, uh, Alexandria received uh, criminals that were due to execution from the Ptolemy to run experiments on them. So they ran vivisections on uh, criminals condemned to death. And they ran it, you know, they opened their skull and they ran experiments. And they noticed that, you know, you touch parts of the brain and so on, and this brings about changes. And we find similar argument later in uh, Galen, Galenus. Yeah. And that's uh, the second, uh, third century is uh, AD. And uh, Galen didn't do any such horrible experiments, but he operated on uh, people with uh, injuries in the skull. Um, for, for instance, gladiators in Rome, and he noticed, so he put something under the, you know, to, to cover the brain when he took out the parts of the, broken parts of the skull, and so on, and he saw the effects of pressing on the brain. And he saw that uh, our awareness, uh, memory, perception, all suffer from brain uh, pressure, brain, brain interference. So by late antiquity, it was clear that uh, it's not the heart which is responsible for uh, our mental capacities, but the brain. Galen, uh, who was a Platonist, mentions it uh, as uh, one of the great uh, advantages of Plato, great advantages of Plato over Aristotle, that he thought it's the brain and not the heart. Um, this uh, answers one point that you made. Why the brain? Why not the heart? But uh, uh, why only the brain is answered by additional things we mentioned here. Until Descartes, people thought that uh, perception is shared by humans and animals, that animals don't have a mind, that they have a soul, and that the soul acts in the sense organs. Look, you touch something cold, you feel it in your hand. If the soul is responsible for that, so the soul should be somehow also uh, present in your hand. Or uh, you feel uh, hunger or pains or whatever. Um, the images which you see, my image, is in your eye. You have to have uh, the perceptive soul in your eye somehow. This is a common view until uh, the time before Descartes. But Descartes, which, who eliminates the sensitive soul, which we share with animal, shared with animal, and has only the mind, keeps the mind where uh, the earlier tradition, Galen, etc., put it in the brain, and he doesn't put any immaterial power in the sense organs. So that's why it's only the brain. You see, the sensitive soul, which people thought acts in our sense organs, disappears. So you have only the mind acting in the brain. And why the pineal gland? The pineal gland, because that's the symmetrical place in the middle of the brain, so he thought, wait, I found it. It's the pineal gland. Thank you so much. Sure. Anyone else? Thank you. you. You highlighted the connection between automatas and the sinking of Descartes. 
in the end, the, the automata is is deterministic, right? In its so, sorry, say again. The automata it's deterministic. The automaton is is deterministic in what it does. It shows no variability. So, what was Descartes' take on on determinism? Did, did he see them perceive it? In, in accordance to your view, I would, would assume that in the end, he really received then the, the world surrounding him as deterministic, which to my opinion or to, to my knowledge, I'm not so sure to which degree he, he followed that. Right. Yeah, thanks. Um, material nature, according to Descartes, is indeed deterministic. The mind is immaterial. We have free will because we have a mind. That's Descartes. Now, uh, Descartes writes in the Principles of Philosophy that uh, we know that we have free will from our own experience, but uh, he cannot uh, explain it. You should remember that uh, asserting things with a high uh, religious significance was very s s dangerous in several ways at the time. During uh, Descartes' lifetime, Jordan Bruno was uh, burnt at the stake. The libertines uh, in France were executed in the 1620s and 1630s. So first you have to be very cautious for your life. Secondly, if you want your uh, writings to be read, not to say taught at the universities, you shouldn't uh, get into any argument with religious authorities. Descartes wanted his uh, writings to replace scholastic writings in, uh, at the universities. This is uh, explicit and seen also in the structure of uh, uh, the principles of philosophy. So whatever exactly he thought about, you know, free will and indeterminism, perhaps he wouldn't put it in his writings even. But we can take him for his word. Material nature is deterministic. Our free will uh, is due to our mental capacities, which you don't find in material nature or uh, in animals. And that's where we have uh, indeterminism. In this respect, we are unlike automata. So uh, the determinism of automata does not bring Descartes and need not bring him to think that all nature is deterministic because unlike automata, we have an immaterial mind which uh, in, uh, you know, interacts with material nature. So if you have indeterminism in the metal realm, you can uh, have indeterminism in the... Uh, uh, in nature, which includes human beings. That's, uh, um, of course, then the question arises, how do you uh, reconcile indeterminism with uh, God's uh, pre-knowledge? <laughs> you don't find an explanation of this in Descartes, and deliberately so, I would say. Yeah, that's something uh, you shouldn't, uh, uh, you know, interfere with if he wants uh, um, to have the success for his uh, works. So he doesn't write about that. Okay, so that's, uh, the, uh, I hope this answers uh, your question. Gerhard, um, I'm so glad because I have uh, such a heavy question uh, and I'm glad oh that God. I can't get to, answer, uh, to, answer, uh, to ask it. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, it will help me. Uh, you you ended with Turing, and and I think I didn't get the Sorry. story in the right way, uh, because you started with, with the heavy dualism between body and mind. And when I now translate uh, the body into animal machine, and uh, translate the mind into the Turing machine then you get a monism, uh, a machinic monism. And that would uh, lead me to that, to Spinoza, and, and that in the middle there, 
ist das, I don't know the, the English term, affizierte Leib. The affected uh, body. Or uh, uh, the, die vitale Regung, uh, Stern. Or vital movements, vital... Um, and, and, and in this way, uh, this uh, big dualism is imploding. Uh, was, was this your intention? Uh, yes. Um, even after the card, there were uh, monist uh, views, materialist views. We should ask what was their, uh, how many helped them, what was their influence, and, and so on. Um, also, we should be cautious because when we move to the 18th century, uh, people who were apparently uh, materialists thought that there is some sort of a long vital or something like that. So this is not the materialism uh, that we have uh, post, uh, you know, in the 20th century. I know special principle is there. Um, now going back to uh, Spinoza. Spinoza is uh, indeed an interesting case because he had both the body and the mind, but there are two uh, different uh, attributes, uh, parallel attributes of the same single substance, God or nature. So uh, according to Spin, and uh, each one is independent of uh, the other in principle. So you know, we when we give explanations, we mix them. But uh, uh, if we went according to the logical order of things, we could, in principle, distinguish between the merely bodily and the merely mental, and each one stands uh, completely on its own. And this is something he goes into in the scolium. Um, to the first part, I think, uh, or the second part of the uh, ethics, where he says, nobody has yet shown what the limitations of the body are. Um, now, this is something Spinoza is committed to, given his uh, theory of attributes, this parallelism. And um, he doesn't show how to answer Descartes' arguments. He doesn't point to uh, anything in any of these two arguments which he finds unsatisfactory. And I think for that reason, he had uh, limited uh, influence. It was easier to be an idealist than to be a materialist following Descartes. If you are an idealist, and you know, Barclay on, you have uh, idealism uh, very common in uh, Western thought, Hegel also, etc. If you are an idealist, you have the thinking uh, entity. So that's a settled, that's the problematic thing. If you are a materialist, how do you answer the cards uh, uh, to arguments? So I think that uh, in Spinoza, we have a kind of uh, theoretical commitment which had limited influence. Shortly after, and under the influence of uh, Spinoza, we find uh, Leibniz, who uh, in his uh, theory of monads, has, you can uh, say, only these spiritual entities. Um, the uh, bodily world is a kind of reflection of the relations between monads. So you can say, by uh, those uh, monads that have a perception, Leibniz brings in uh, these capacities which are mental and unique to us. How can Spinoza account for them on uh, bodily principles? We don't have an answer in Spinoza. I think this is one reason why this kind of materialism had limited influence um, in the centuries following Spinoza. We find other um, panpsychist views. So, uh, right, so I think uh, Spinoza has a problem which he cannot uh, resolve. And he addresses it by saying nobody has shown the limitations of the bodily, but he doesn't show what's wrong with any of the cards two arguments. Hmm. That's, uh, 
Luisa, you, you can't yes, get away will, from your... Yes, I will try to be very tame and not enter territory that I cannot make my way out of. Um, but, and I was hoping that Kerstin would open up the neo-materialist um, 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 avenue and in a way, Gerhard, you, you pointed that way too and it's kind of difficult, you know, when you left us with touring and with, uh, you know, a technology that now opens up to... Um, so we have to accept that the connections that are made by the, you know, computer um, are such that we cannot distinguish them from the, you know, answers that a human being would be given to a question, as we see in chat GPT. And the interesting thing here is that, you know, all these questions of um, um, mind, self-consciousness, consciousness, you know, are right back at the table here, and everybody wants to know whether the, I, the artificial intelligence, you know, might, you know, actually be able to, you know, become conscious or, you know. But we have gone the other way, in a way, you know. We've developed, you know, um, a theory, a materialist theory that explains the mind not as something that's consciousness or self-consciousness, but more or less as something that is an interconnectedness, an interrelation that is the same as we find in nature. But and now you see the difficult question that comes here, because the confusion is now, um, so the new materialism that we are talking about, or the, the materialism that we rang in with Turing, seems to be one that um, basically has to um, admit that it's all about constellating, um, you know, it's all about um, um, these computer um, mechanic, you know, these moves that then bring about whatever they bring about. Whereas the new materialists, the feminist thinkers, they basically say, and I think of Jane Bennett here, who basically says the same thing, there's no soul that comes on top of the material connections. It's actually within you know, the, um, the um, intra-relations that something that we would think is, you know, I mean, uh, we, we call it, mattering, you know, meaning mattering, but that's not different from the material, you know, connections. And so the, the difficulty of my first question and my last question is actually the question, what kind of materialism, you know, are we really looking at? And can we, I mean, it's a monism. I mean, we, we're not talking about thought patterns, you know, we're talking about constellations um, in the material. So I'm not sure we, we, we speak the same language, but I was just trying to translate the two, uh, the, mm -hmm. the two takes. Because then we can have vital, you know, we can have the vital, you know, the, the, the vital movements, we can have the... But what we don't have in the end is the soul or self-consciousness or consciousness. And obviously that's something that most human beings um, cherish. Mm -hmm. um. Well, I don't quite know uh, how to respond. Um, despite being a philosopher and namely having an answer to uh, practically all questions, I don't know how to uh, answer this thing. Um, so, uh, I, first I'll uh, admit uh, some ignorance. I'm, I'm not familiar with some of these uh, ideas you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. about, you know, the, in, in this part of feminist thought and uh, the relatedness to the body, which I think is indebted to ideas about uh, uh, embodiment uh, and activism and, yep. and so on. And uh, I have my reservations uh, about things there, uh, which uh, I you know you find some confu the confusions, I think, b between uh, empirical uh, facts and uh, conceptual uh, facts and uh, Yes, in my Wittgenstein seminar, going back to this uh, brilliant pupil who was uh, around the corner, uh, uh, I tried to distinguish this thing. That I guess it will have relevance to some of the things you've raised. Um, perhaps I, I'd like to say something about uh, chat GPT and so on. Uh, um, I don't think that uh, these artificial uh, intelligence uh, systems uh, do as much as we uh, 
think or are afraid they are doing. I'm not saying that uh, AI won't be able to uh, do uh, as well as a human being, but uh, they don't do it uh, yet. I'll try to show you something. Um, I don't know whether I'll manage because I have to change the uh, way I'm sharing uh, the screen. Just a second. I have to uh, duplicate the screens. Good. And now I'll open this thing. Right, you can see it. Quantum magazine is a kind of a popular, <laughs> semi-popular um, uh, science magazine. And that's a just recently published uh, article there. Uh, well, I don't see the date here and it will take me too long to find, but you know, a kind of week or two ago, chat box don't know what stuff is. Now, why isn't? Because if you ask them questions that involve negation, <laughs> they get things wrong. They are statistical uh, machines. So, uh, you know, you know that if I, uh, um, what? If uh, I'm not uh, over 180 centimeters tall, I'm not over 190 centimeters tall. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is not something that will come up uh, in a kind of probabilistic way in our writings. If you know that uh, I'm not a, a vehicle, you know I'm not a bus. But uh, ChatGPT and things like that will get these things wrong. Now, this is interesting because, um, you know, uh, Aristotle and etc. characterize us as a zone logon, creature with a logos. Now, logos is both language and logic. And that's why it turns into ratio, rational, and not just language. language. So, uh, an essential part of uh, Logos is understanding of negation, of uh, conjunction, disjunction, of uh, possibility. That's already Aristotle logic. So inter interestingly enough, these machines don't answer in an intelligent way. That's a good way of uh, showing that uh, it's not a human being so far. <laughs> Ask them something that involves negation. They don't have a mind. They don't answer on the basis of understanding. They answer on the basis of statistical uh, prevalence. So as, ask them something that really needs understanding, that involves a mind, something that needs logos, namely language, logic, and they get it wrong. So you can say, they still don't have it. We still like what Aristotle and Descartes thought, we are still the only creatures, whether natural or artificial, with the mind. I'm not saying it will always be like that, but it is still like <laughs> that. And I think with that we can end. Uh, I right, think Elizabeth? so too. Nice, uh, I think only when the technology changes again will perhaps. the jury be out about the mind. Perhaps. Thank you very much, Hanno. Thank you, and thank you all for your uh, questions yeah. and for listening. Same here. Thank you for the audience. Benjamin, tell me when we are not online and I can uh, talk uh, nonsense. I think we are offline, right? Yes. <laughs>